Okay. All right, can everyone hear me fairly clearly? Yeah, for some reason this talk title didn't actually get published in the program, which is... Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. That, that was my fault. All right. <laughs> Not pointing any fingers. Um, this is a talk that I wrote um, originally for EuroBSDCon in Warsaw, and um, Robert Watson, who was actually supposed to give that keynote and couldn't because of his crazy schedule, uh, suggested this topic to me. So uh, he's kind of interested in the interplay between open source and commercial interests, and that's something I happen to know something about. Um, so uh, I'm going to be talking about open source companies here. I do not mean by that people who take in open source, because pretty much everyone does. I'm talking about people who actually you know, contribute back to the community. Um, just out of curiosity, how many people understand the Bambi Godzilla reference? Oh, that's much better than in Poland. Who doesn't? Because half the audience has been to Poland. Aha. Well, I, I, I don't believe I'm legally allowed to play it, but I do actually have it in my slide deck, so if we have time, I'll maybe toss that in. Um, I had to throw this one in. It was appropriate. Uh, in Poland because that is in fact where I was. I was uh, down in South Africa and got a very small amount of internet and had this email saying, can you do this? And so I had to leave this slide in uh, because it's the most interesting slide in the entire presentation. <laughs> so uh, a little bit about my background. I started writing open source software back around 1975. We, of course, didn't call it that then. Uh, it was just software. Um, I worked on the Ingress relational database system starting when I was an undergraduate. This was back when, rel when relational databases didn't exist yet. So it was, it was new and shiny back then. Uh, in the process of that, I wrote syslog, the MET ROF macros, which some people, believe it or not, still use. Uh, a game called Trek, which, believe it or not, some people still play, um, a bunch of other BSD utilities. Uh, I'm best known for SendMail. You probably all know that already. Um, I am not a kernel guy. Um, if you want that, talk to Kirk. Uh, I've always stayed kind of the user level, although I did write a few uh, device drivers, all blessedly defunct now. Um, who uses punch ta cards and nine track tape anymore? I ask you now. Um, I think probably the most important thing I did was I uh, convinced Berkeley, notably Bill Joy, to start using SCCS. And hence, history begins on the day I got him to do that. Uh, <laughs> I've, had, I've had jobs in academia. Um, uh, commercial environments, research, sort of all over the place. I've done all kinds of crazy things. And I started SendMail Inc. in 1998. It was one of the very first uh, attempts to merge open source and hybrid. There were some companies that were trying to be pure open source companies, but none of them actually did very well because it hurt, turns out it's really hard to make money when you're giving everything away. Uh, and we did survive the tech crash, which made us better than about 90% of the other startups out there. Um, however, I will say uh, that companies are, uh, should be added to the list of things you don't want to see made. That includes sausages, laws, and companies. Um, it's an ugly process, and I'll tell you a little bit about that. Uh, I am now officially retired from SendMail uh, as of September. I am, however, still on good terms with them, and hopefully after this talk I still will be. Uh, so, SendMail started as one of the first, SendMail, the program, not the company, started as one of the uh, very early open source projects, which was actually part of BSD. Uh, it was a classic example of scratching your own itch. I had a problem at Berkeley, and uh, it was easier to write code than to do it by hand, and so I wrote code. Uh, and then it turns out, of course, other people had the same problem, and it went on from there. Uh, it went through various growth spurts. There was a time when I abandoned it for a while because I was bored with it. I'd get bored very easily, as it turns out. Um, and then I came back to it. Uh, it was originally built to solve a single local problem, uh, but it got generalized due to community need, um, got caught up in the internet explosion, which was an interesting process by itself. 
and it pretty much remained community supported in one way or another um, through most of its history. I did use the uh, benevolent dictator with trusted henchman model, which is pretty much what uh, Linus has done. However, the internet did explode and I turned into a success disaster. Uh, the community scaling pretty much collapsed. I was spending all of the time I had available. Remember, I still got a full-time job at this point, which is not send mail. And uh, I was constantly getting these questions, all of which, of course, well, 99% of which were answered in the documentation, but it's easier for some people to send email than it is to actually read, uh, which appears to be a unique concept. Um, some projects there use the RTFM, read the fine manual, um, which can also be phrased as you're on your own. Um, it does, however, require fairly sophisticated users who are capable of reading, which, as I said, is uh, sometimes not a good decision, and a fine manual to read, uh, which turns out to be a major problem with a lot of open source projects. You can't tell them to go read the manual when there's no manual to read. I assert here, without proof, that all successful large open source projects get some side of out, kind of outside support at some time. This can be, I don't necessarily mean money, but I mean uh, employers that are willing to let you work on this stuff, you know, part time. Uh, you know, if you're a student, um, maybe you get to get some funds from the university or your parents are paying for you to go and do whatever you want, but whatever it is. Um, I wanted to get back to doing coding. I was tired of doing the support stuff, which as I said was taking all of my time, so I had this fantasy. I would hire a support person and they would answer all of these stupid questions and I could go back to doing what I wanted to do, which was write code. Okay, to do that I had to ditch the day job and I had to get some funding. So I ended up starting a company. Now, there's a number of ways you can get money coming into a project. Um, one of the popular ones is to start a foundation and get donations, and there's a lot of these. Mozilla, Eclipse, Apache, FreeBSD all have foundations. It is, turns out it's very hard to set up a foundation. It requires very special skills, especially if you're going to do a 501c3, a not-for-profit. Uh, which has a lot of legal mess, so you have to get lawyers involved and so forth. So in order to become not-for-profit, you have to spend a lot of money. Um, you can find a patron who will shower you with money, uh, which works great if you're like Bach or Mozart or you know, one of the fine artists and, and you happen to live in Vienna in the right century. Um, but these days, the alternative is having a very rich uncle who indulges you, and I don't. You can sell yourself to a company that has deep pockets, and this can be very effective in some cases. However, keep in mind that they don't necessarily have your best interests in mind. I can almost guarantee to you that their image of what they want to do is not fully aligned with what you want. So you're going to have to make some compromises. And uh, your leverage is extremely limited if you, your brain, is the only asset. And um, there are other assets. If you have a large enough community or user base or whatever, you might actually be able to leverage that. But if you don't have something large enough to be of interest, you know, they'll basically reassign you the first time things come along. Uh, and you can start your own company. Uh, Red Hat started before SendMail, but was initially trying to do a pure open source play. SendMail was one of the very first that explicitly in the business plan said, we want to combine the two and somehow uh, get them to talk to each other. I actually tried something uh, along the lines of a foundation. It was really more of a consortium where I went to a bunch of vendors who were all shipping send mail and said, if you put in a small amount of money each year, you don't have to have people working full time because they all had at least one person working full time on send mail. And uh, I'll do that for you. And to a one, they said, that sounds like a great idea as long as we own it when it's done and that wasn't an acceptable uh, thing. So just a quick word about foundations because they are so popular. Uh, they do insulate you from the day-to-day -day pressures of corporations. Um, they're not necessarily, well, they're not looking quarter to quarter, um, which is one of the standard things that corporations do these days. 
but they do not prevent you from being pressured in other ways. If one of your major funders comes along and says, I will cut your funding next year unless you do this or don't do this or whatever, uh, then you're stuck. Um, they do take a lot of work to start and keep running. They typically all have a at least half-time executive director, so there's an overhead to the bureaucracy of all of this, especially if it's a not-for-profit, because it's all the tax forms that have to be done and so forth. And you may lose some of the good things that you do get from a real corporation, like marketing input is not fundamental to, um, to a uh, uh, foundation. Um, I should say one of the things that foundations require is um, continuous grant proposals, uh, which are hard to write, and uh, ongoing schmoozing with your funders, because they all think that they're, you know, even if they just give $100, they think they're really special. So I'm going to assert that open source actually needs commercial input. And um, my next slide is going to say why this is heretical, in case you don't know already. Um, but I'm going to start by saying developers, in fact, are seldom uh, the customers. Okay? In the old days, you know, when I wrote SendMail, I was my own customer. I didn't have to go and have somebody explain to me what it was the customer needed, because I was the one who needed it. And uh, things went fine for a long time, and very successfully, because for the first time, people were writing the tools that they actually wanted to get, as opposed to having some corporation try to shove whatever they had down their throats. However, when you start to get into non-developer software, and um, I'll just use consumer software in general uh, as a stand-in for that, uh, the designs tend to run from um, really pretty mediocre to sometimes just unbelievably bad. I mean, it's like people have to sit up late at night trying to figure out how they can screw this up. And that's us, folks. Uh, we don't think like normal human beings. Okay? It doesn't mean, by the way, we're all loners. Some are but some people are quite social, but they just think, well, this is a logical set of conclusions, and so it must be obvious to everyone, and it's not. People just don't work that way. And uh, in companies, you have these things called product managers, and a great product manager is somebody who has a certain amount of technical background, but is also very good at talking to the customers and doing the translation between the two. So, you know, good product manager, most of their job is just being a translator. Um, however, it is also true that not all product managers are great product managers. In fact, fairly few of them, unfortunately. Um, so uh, there are examples of other benefits that you get from a corporation, uh, soft items. Co corporations actually pay people to write documentation. Uh, some, uh, some open source projects have been pretty good about that, but it's not one of open source's traditional strengths, shall we say. Um, Frontline support to unburden the developers, uh, insulate them a little bit. Um, you know, overhead, you know, at home, if I want to upgrade my network, I have to do it myself. At work, somebody does it for me. Um, okay. But there is this deep tension between open source and commercial ventures. Uh, Open source is, might loosely be described as being about building things, you know, creating things, sharing things with other people, flexibility to do what it is you want, what you think you need, um, making the world a better place in some sense, uh, although we can debate some of those. Solving an interesting problem is often a big part of it. Uh, Sometimes personal development, hey, I need to learn about this, so I'll write some code and, and experience it that way. All these kind of things which, ironically, are almost a little bit touchy-feely. Commercial software development is about making money. Make no mistake about that. That's what it's about. It is not about great technology. It is not about making something beautiful. It is not about making the world a better place. Money's the life blood of companies. And uh, that's one of those things where when I started a company, I have to admit I was a little hippy-dippy and was kind of thinking, oh, we're going to have a different kind of company that's going to, you know, birds will be singing and so forth, and it's not that way. Sales guys don't understand how to make money by giving the product away. I was multiple times 
before I had a hissy fit in a staff meeting, accused of being a communist by the salespeople. And they were serious. I mean, it was like, you're a fucking communist. Um, it's like, look, I started the company. I don't think communists start companies. <laughs> Um, there is an immense pressure toward feature creep to keep people coming back and buying more. It's not good enough for them to just download your software and install it. They have to keep coming back year after year. Look at something, you know, a monstrosity like Quicken. Every year there's all this pressure to buy the new version of Quicken. Their strategy now is it just shuts down after three years. It won't work at all. Um, and so you're forced to buy a new version which has new features that I don't want. Uh, typically known as feature creep, which can be defined as doing more and more, less and less well. Um, the other thing, though, that is very important in companies is if you miss payroll, you're dead. You know, if I, in my personal life, I'm willing to sort of take out a loan against my next month's income or something like that, and that's okay. Not true in companies. When they hit the wall, it's all over. And it can happen very, very suddenly and very, very surprisingly. So let me talk a little bit about markets. Um, who wants to buy open source stuff? Okay, folks who just want it for free, really, really hard for, to make money off of people whose top priority is that they get it for free. Um, businesses, well, what does a business mean? What size? I mean, are you talking about small businesses? Are you talking about uh, enterprise markets, medium-sized business, carrier grade is one of the things they like to talk, talk about, the, uh, particularly with things like email servers, carrier grade is like you run all of Comcast or something on it. Um, consumers, well, consumers are very fickle. They need a lot of polish. Um, and polish is, you know, when, I, when we were first running X11 at Berkeley, uh, there were these toolkits coming out that really loaded down your machine, and they did things like they made the corners of buttons rounded. And I was like, why the fuck would I throw away my machine to make buttons rounded? Well, in truth, you need rounded corners on your buttons. It's just the way it is. Square buttons look clunky. It's, it's a kind of crazy thing. Uh, the other thing I should say about businesses, by the way, is that they don't just buy product. They buy trust. Um, they buy, you know, confidence, whatever, and, you know, the, what that means is not necessarily that the code's going to be great or anything like that, it's that they trust the company behind it, they believe they're going to be supported and so forth. That's very, very hard to do in an open source environment where you can at any time say, you know, I'm bored with this, I'm going to go on. They want something that they know has a uh, vested incentive in staying alive. Um, open source does tend to commoditize a market. Uh, we saw that very clearly with MTAs. There were a number of attempts of, of very expensive MTAs, OpenWave, uh, Sun had something they called, I uh, can't remember what now. And as MTAs became, free MTAs became more ubiquitous, they just couldn't sell that. And we certainly knew that going into SendMail, so we had to find something else to do. Uh, and generally that means moving up the, the supply chain, the food chain, um, making fancier stuff. Um, I want to emphasize that a lot of founders start off thinking that they've got this really great technology and so they should start a company. Really great technology has very, very little to do with starting a company. And, um, you know, if I sound bitter, maybe that's because I am a little bit. I learned a lot, though. So there's a number of models that you can use to actually make some money off of open source. One is you keep all of your source free and you sell something else. This is kind of what Red Hat tried to do. They sold you know, support, they sold services, they sold customization, that kind of thing. But the code was free. Um, they, you also can sell stability. And when I say stability here, I don't necessarily mean stability of the code. But once again, it's that trust that I was just talking about, the, the belief that you will be in business you know, next quarter, next year. Um, but there are limited economies of scale on this. The, most everything that's in there uh, requires, as you ha add customers, you have to add employees. And the nice thing about things like software is it doesn't really cost you very much at all for somebody else to do another download. So it's the same 
you know, if you have 10 customers and a million customers. Um, another approach is to keep it free but to sell bundles. Uh, this is kind of the fundamental thing behind a lot of appliances. Um, you know, they, you ship them a box and they, it looks like they're buying the hardware but they're not really. What they're buying is all this stuff bundled together. The hardware costs next to nothing, typically, um, unless you have special back plans or things like that. Um, distros can, can be this way. You get this distro and you uh, drop it in and it just works. If you've ever tried to um, configure X11 on FreeBSD, for example, uh, not PCBSD, but FreeBSD, you'll know why you want to do that. Uh, you can have free basic technology um, with uh, non-open source add-ons. Um, this generally works best when you have a fairly clean extension model and, uh, or somehow have some way you can wrap the open source software in commercial uh, software. Because if you actually have to go in and add, you know, do a custom version of the open source software that has the commercial extensions, then you're not really selling the open source anymore. You're selling open source plus plus or minus minus as the case may be. Uh, this generally supersets the sell something else, i.e. it includes everything in that category. You certainly don't you know, so send out an appliance and not have a support phone number, for example. Um, the uh, send mail, by the way, was the third style. Uh, so we, in some sense, pioneered this. Um, there's the fourth one that has been tried a couple times, which is you do the technology grab. You take the open source software, you say, okay, that's frozen in time, we're never going to support it again. If you want the supported version, you have to buy the commercial one. And people tend to vote with their feet, and those things tend to just go away. Uh, ironically, even things that they might pay for, they will walk away from just because you took it away from them. So. I have a whole talk on starting a company, and I'm not going to give it today. Uh, I've said before, starting a company is, has very, very little to do with technology. I mean, a little technology is a good thing, but um, it is about finance. You know, starting from the first day you go out with your hat in hand, trying to get somebody to give you money. That's about sales. It's about marketing. Um, it's about support. It's about services. I uh, should include it's about management there, but I didn't. And yeah, and there's some engineering. Um, engineering is, in most companies is a tiny fraction of the budget. I have to confess, when I started off, I didn't know what most of these things did, and I, now I do, and um, I'm not sure I'm better off for it. Keep in mind, the three most powerful positions in any company are the CEO, the VP of sales, and the chief financial officer. Those are the ones who run the company. Notice VP of engineering is not in that list. So what can we observe? Well, finance is obviously about money. You know, you're trying to get people to give you money. You know, initially the investors, later on the customers, so forth, and avoid uh, having other people take it away. Sales, obviously about money. I mean, what else? Marketing, that's eh, a little more indirect, but it's basically about making it easier for people to buy your product. So it's about getting money into the company. Support, well, you charge for support. You know, it doesn't scale as well as software sales, but you know, it's still definitely about, you, you don't like give support away because it's a very expensive thing to give away. Services is, support and services tend to differ because services is more about customization and things like that. And you charge a bundle for services. That's, that's the you know, $3,000 a day consultant thing. And engineering. Oh, that's a cost center. <laughs> you know, engineers don't go out and get people to send the money. They, in fact, sit around going, we need more money for us to do our development. It's the only major function that really looks like a major cost center as opposed to a profit center. So uh, just a little word about corporate culture. Um, I debated whether I would put this in because this, you can deep dive on this really easily. Um, the major one is, is the company going to be engineering or sales marketing driven? There's a number of nuances in here. Some companies try to avoid asking the culture question at all. Um, you know, the usual argument is, well, you know, 
these have to be equal, and if you know, you're even asking the question, then uh, there's something wrong with your fundamental model. And when that happens, sales and marketing wins. There's almost no company that is, in fact, engineering driven. The major one I can think of is um, Google. Uh, it's definitely an anomaly. They did a lot of very unusual things <coughs> starting up that company. And um, certainly, if you think you're going to start the next Google, uh, look at their financial structure uh, at least as much as their technology, because their financial structure is fascinating. Uh, investors prefer the sales marketing driven approach, and they run the board. Really, the investors run the board, but generally speaking, the founders are not the major investors. So you don't really have that power. Now, pure sales and marketing driven um, leads to some obvious ab um, aberrations, but it turns out it's very hard to avoid this. In a fiscal crisis, and it comes down to do we support the people who are bringing money into the company or the people who are spending the money, in a fiscal crisis, the ones bringing the money in always win. Okay, remember, money is the lifeblood of companies. Um, a fiscal crisis, by the way, always comes along sooner or later. It doesn't matter what company you are, how well funded, or whatever. It will happen one way or another. The possible exception to this is when you're sitting on a uh, cash pile of a billion gazillion dollars. Uh, which means you're Apple or Google, because I think they're the only companies around that are like that. Um, the big difference between um, these two concepts is the short-term versus long-term view. Um, companies these days, this has not always been historically true, but in the last 40 years, 50 years, um, companies tend to be focused on the next quarter. I mean, actually, next quarter is their long-term view. This quarter is the short-term view. Next quarter is long-term. Engineers like to think a year out, five years out, that sort of thing. Um, and this changes in very deep ways the way you think about almost all problems. So assuming you're trying to convince your company that they ought to be doing some open source, there are some justifications you can make. This is not an exhaustive list by any means. Um, one, the kind of the standard one is, oh, well, if we do this, we can, uh, you know, get a, people contributing to our project, we get community, um, they'll write code for us, it'll cut our costs, et cetera, et cetera. And that does happen sometimes, not always. Licenses can be a showstopper here, so pick your license very carefully. Um, it can be useful as a recruiting incentive if you're, for whatever reason needs really hot engineers for the project you're working on, um, they tend to really like working on open source stuff. And uh, the thing that's a little sneaky there, uh-oh, um, it can be useful as a recruiting incentive, but it can have the uh, unintended, well, unintended to them, maybe very intended to you, of having a culture sh uh, shift because People who work on open source software tend to have different uh, priorities than even engineers that work on closed source software. Uh, one of the things that is really interesting is, uh, and some uh, CEOs get this, is you can disrupt the market. And if you can disrupt the market in a way that uh, your competitors are not expecting, but you are, you can get an advantage over them that way. It's a little tricky to play off because, of course, it makes it harder for you to make money as well, but um, at least you are not uh, stuck with the uh, element of surprise. Um, and it can make certain customers more comfortable. These customers are not consumers or anything like that. They're the big corporations that have their own you know, highly technical adept people in-house because what happens is if for whatever reason you go under, uh, but they have the source code, they're not dead in the water. They can still do things. And for a certain small but fairly large class, small but large, small class of customers, but those customers are large enterprises, um, this can actually be a good thing. This is not exhaustive, as I said, it's just a few I could think of. So I want to do some life cycle comparisons here. Uh, 
this was actually definitely Robert's suggestion, and it's kind of interesting. I s took uh, sort of open source projects, um, research, uh, that is to say non-military, non-proprietary research, so this doesn't apply to pharmaceutical companies, for example, who have a whole different view of what research is, and then a, a company. And the similarities on this I'll try and point out, and there's also some spectacular differences. So everything starts off with the initial inspiration, you know, the idea, the light bulb, whatever. In open source, it's usually scratch and itch. This is very broadly defined. Uh, it can mean I have a problem. It can mean I, you know, somebody came up and said, boy, if it sure would be neat if we had blah, blah, blah. A research project is, starts by asking a question. You know, what if we mix these two chemicals together? I wonder what would happen. <laughs> Boom. Um, companies start by seeing a revenue opportunity. Simple as that. So the next step is kind of making it possible. You got the idea, now you want to flesh it out. So with open source, you start by seeing if it's already been done. Oh, whoops. Actually, <laughs> People tend to go the opposite direction far too often. Oh, somebody else did it, but I don't like the way they did it, so I'm going to do it again. Okay. Um, it's not clear that the world gets best value out of that. You do an architectural design. Um, some people sometimes. Um, open source often sort of grows. There's this whole thing called agile programming uh, that is very popular right now, which can work very well, but for a lot of people, it's what it really means is I don't want to think about the design now, I'll worry about that later after I've got the code working. There's something wrong with that. You choose your language tool and tools, that tends to happen very early in open source compared to the others, and you start writing code. Uh, simple as that. Research project, you start off kind of the same as open source. You research the literature, see what's already been done, see what the outstanding problems are. You've got to get funding. Um, open source projects typically don't have to start off by thinking about getting funding. So in this case, research is more like uh, companies. And you start to line up your grad students. Uh, in the company, you write a business plan. Business plans actually can be very useful. Uh, when you try and justify these things even to yourself, sometimes big holes open up. You line up your investors, which is, um, well, I don't have time to go into that. Investors are herd animals, let's put it that way. And uh, figure out a cor corporate culture, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, that's an optional step. A lot of companies skip it entirely, and uh, that tends to run and create problems later. Uh, but it can be done. And you hire a team, um, once the investors have come in, at least. Birthing the baby, um, making it actually happen. Open source, you do your, your early releases, 0.x, and you start building your community. Uh, getting early users, the ones who like to live on the bleeding edge. Uh, research projects, you start writing the code, doing the actual research, and you start writing uh, write-ups that go into certain kind of conferences and that sort of thing, maybe uh, leak stuff to the press so they'll start writing about, you know, the cool new quantum computing thing you're working on, whatever. And with a company, you start building your product, so in that sense, once again, it's kind of like a research project. You line up early customers. You always want to have some early customers, in part to get feedback from them on what it is they want to buy. If you're really lucky, you can get them to pay for the product before you've built it, and uh, that's part of the financing models. And you start doing trade shows, get the buzz going. You want people to anticipate your product when it comes out. So making it real. Open source, you do release 1.0. Um, you discover you have a support problem. This seems to always happen, even if you think you've anticipated it. And so you figure out a way to deal with that. And you discover, by the way, the docs, if you wrote docs at all, they're not good enough. So this is where the real kind of problems start to come up in open source. In a research project, well, it's all about publish or perish. You start, got to start churning those papers out, go to conferences, et cetera. We have friends at Berkeley who are grad students, and it seems like every three weeks they're submitting another new paper, and I don't know how they do it. In a company, you get your first release out. You've probably got a little bit of sales and marketing and so forth, but now you need to start to scale those up, make it a little more real. Well, the next obvious step is you need to grow the thing. Um, 
So in open source, well, if you don't have users, if you don't have a community, you're over. You're done. Otherwise, you write the O'Reilly book. This is a very, very important step, as any open source writer will tell you. Um, you try and avoid second system effect, although this is a purely optional step. Um, <laughs> and come up with release two. A research project, um, you know, research projects, you don't really grow them, you sort of wind them down and move on. So it's thesis time, your uh, student slaves uh, start to graduate, and you write the, uh, the hard journal, you know, the transactions on kind of uh, papers. The company, you uh, do your second release. At this point, you really need to get to profitability. Um, so part of getting to profitability almost always involves doing a layoff. So this is your first or maybe second or possibly third round of layoffs. Um, and uh, you probably get another investment round. So the idea is we want to become profitable. We uh, cut our expenses down by laying off everyone we don't possibly need. We go out to investors and say, oh, look at how good our books are. You should give us more money. And then you continue on from then. I'm sorry, but that's the way it really works. And then the next steps are, uh, what do you do? Open source is actually it's a more complicated problem than you might think. You might just throw it to the winds. Notice, by the way, that most people who work on open source projects don't do it for the rest of their lives. Some do. There are exceptions. But most of them want to go off and do something else, because the exciting thing is writing stuff. It's not supporting it. Um, so you know, throw it to the winds. It'll, if somebody else will pick it up if it's important. Another one is handing it over to some larger organization. You go and try and get the Apache Foundation to pick it up, or you know, this can include selling it to a company. It can be commercialize it, start a, your own company around it. Um, maybe you just keep going and say, well, I'm having fun, and you know, I'll just keep working on it. There's absolutely nothing wrong with this in the open source world. Remember, you don't have to be doing getting a continuing income stream because there's no such thing to begin with. In a research project, the next step is to ask another question, which is often suggested by the previous cycle. In the company, there's kind of three outcomes. You have what's called a liquidity event, which is where the investors get to take their money out, and then you continue ongoing, and that becomes an ongoing uh, project. You have a liquidity event. This is usually by being purchased by a larger company, and you get assimilated into that company, and you go away. And that may or may not mean that you're um, engineers and any of your employees keep going on. Uh, you can be assimilated and they'll just kill off your product. Um, there's just no givens here. It can mean it becomes the center of their product line. And of course there's bankruptcy and die. Which, you know, once again, you don't have the option of just throwing it out to the winds and let somebody else support it. You, you die. So, I'm um, going to finish up here. Um, there's kind of two big mistakes that founders make, which almost always cause the founders to be forced out um, sometime fairly soon. Founders are always surprised that they're out of a job within three to five years, generally, sometimes less than that. First is assuming that they know everything. This is by far the most common. I know exactly the way I want this company to be. Uh, I'm going to control it. I'm not going to let anybody else try and convince me otherwise, this is the way I want it. Um, you don't know everything, especially about the areas you don't know anything about, and making other people's lives miserable will involve a palace coup and you will be out. It's just the way it is. The second one is assuming, it's the, kind of the opposite, assuming that everyone else knows more than you do and, um, and they have no hidden agendas. Everyone has hidden agendas. I even have hidden agendas. Um, beware of people who try and tell you that their field is so complicated that they can't possibly explain it to you. I mean, you're smart people. Uh, you can probably actually understand a lot of this. In the case of SendMail, we started off with a very, very good VP of marketing, which was a complete shock to me because I'd never met a good VP of marketing before that. And um, he was, every time I asked a question, he was like eager to explain it. He really wanted the engineers to understand what marketing was all about. He listened to the engineers and, and worked things together and so forth. 
He left, we got another one in who preferred locking his office door, not letting anyone in. He believed in quantitative marketing, so he spent all of his time looking at spreadsheets and graphs as opposed to being out talking to people, uh, which is a very bad thing. And that's when I started to be told, well, you know, you, you, you don't understand this. And I made the mistake, perhaps, of pulling back too far, going, okay, you know, I don't want to, it's not that I thought they, I couldn't understand it, it's that I didn't want to be uh, getting in the way and so forth. So obviously some sort of happy balance is needed, and that's very, very hard to find. So some conclusions. There is some good news. I don't have any doubt that commercial input to open source has allowed it to take on much larger problems than it could without that commercial input. Um, it's it, both in terms of the scale of things that it has been able to approach and um, the kinds of problems it's been able to approach. Um, that's a big, big change from 1975, I can assure you. The bad news, of course, is that open source in this process has sort of lost its innocence. Um, you know, the cor corporations emphasize the short-term survival over technological beauty and so forth, and so uh, open source at some point has to internalize some of that, and that's not always a great thing. So finally, there is a third mistake that founders make. This is one I made in abundance. Believing that you'll be able to get back to coding by starting a company. <laughs> Thank you. So, do we have time for questions? Yep. <clears throat> okay. Uh, got a minute for a question or two. Or I can run the video. Yeah, run the video. Run the video. Run the video. Ah. Never mind. Sorry. Maybe I can't run the video. <laughs> nope. It only runs a minute and a half. This, by the way, was done as a student film project at uh, UCLA, I think. Yeah, who felt that earthquake? Yeah. It might have, I, at first I thought it was construction trucks going by, but no, Ottawa does have earthquakes. Not, not very serious earthquakes, but they do have earthquakes. Thank you, Eric. Much appreciated. Everyone says I run a great conference, but I can't do it without sponsors. Well, I did the first year. But. <laughs> S sponsors do far more than I can acknowledge here. Um, BSG Cam wouldn't exist as it does today without the 
the, the kind and consistent support from our sponsors. If you have day-to-day -day contact with any of these organizations, please be sure to mention that you noticed that they sponsored BSD CAN and how much that means to you. So um, my main sponsors are IX Systems, EMC, who are doing the party tonight, uh, the FreeBSD Foundation, uh, Google, uh, Tilted Windmill Press, which is Michael Lucas, who's over here. Hi, Michael. Tarsnap, which is Colin Collins over here. Collins at the back corner. Scale Engine. These two gentlemen here, they are streaming the talks. Uh, OVH.com, there's an insert in your packets from them. Uh, NetGate and BSD Magazine. So if you deal with them, tell them thank you. Thank them for um, sponsoring BSD Camp. There is also the program committee, the usual suspects. Um, I run the conference, but they choose the talks. So if you're a speaker here, thank them. If you're an attendee here, thank the speakers for thanking the program committee. Uh, volunteers. Uh, I can't do everything during the conference, so we've got lots of volunteers to do things. Some of them are you. Some of them helped. Some of you help carry boxes every year. Someone carries boxes. And the registration pack assembly. Okay, we are going to have a very short history of BSG Camp. Um, I got started with FreeBSD in 2008. Later that year, I started the FreeBSD Diary. And then about 2000 or so, I started Fresh Ports. Um, the one thing, okay, why is that, why are those particular things relevant? The community I, I entered was very receptive. Um, I contributed, and then BSG Can. I became known within the community just by contributing. So when time came to start at BSG Can, it was a lot easier for me. Um, I'd been to BSG Con and liked it. Uh, Usenix, Usenix was good, but it wasn't quite the same as BSG Con. Um, and here in Ottawa, there's something called the Ottawa Linux Symposium, and I'd been to that a couple of times, and I knew the guy that ran that. Um, then when the call went out from, uh, when I got the idea to run BSC Can, the call went out and I had no sponsors, I had zero budget, I was hoping that I could cancel and not be out of pocket if we didn't get registrations. Um, I was hoping for one track and eight talks, we got three rooms and 23 talks. Uh, I needed about 40 people to break even, I got 194. Um, now we're about 27 talks and we have cookies. <laughs> Next slide, quickly, quickly, quickly. Never go back, never go back. There we go. All right. Now, all of this is possible because of you all, because I can't get speakers without attendees coming. Well, I can, but they're just going to talk to themselves, and that's no fun. And it's hard to get sponsors without having people coming, because they're not going to sponsor it unless there's people here. <coughs> What's the lesson from this? Always be receptive to newbies. You never know what they're going to grow up to be. Okay. Food and drink. Lunch will be at 12.30. There's going to be snacks, fruit, 2.30. Uh, tomorrow morning from about 9 a.m. Talks don't start until 10, but from 9 a.m. there'll be food out there again. Um, points of order for the Hacker Lounge. If you don't know where the Hacker Lounge is, it's in residence on the ground floor. It's a big glass in area. Keep it tidy, play well, be safe, blah, 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 blah. Party tonight at my condo. Not my condo, but a place called mycondo.com. It's downtown. Um, have a look at the map. You can find out where it is. Uh, if in doubt, ask someone where the U.S. Embassy is. Put your back to the door. Walk straight. It's on your right-hand side. There's a boff at 530 in this room, a ZFS boff. Off. If anyone's interested in ZFS, you want to be here. Um, and MRT 221 is also available from 5.30 tonight if anyone else wants to run a BOF. Sign up at the registration desk, but they don't know you're coming. Your registration bags, not all of them are created equal. There is not enough of each swag to go around. None of you know what all the swag is. You'll have to ask other people what they got to find out. 
if this creates a trading vacuum. So if anyone wants to trade to get the good swag, you've got to come up with something really good. If you do not want your registration bag, do not throw it out. Return it to the registration desk and we will donate it to a local food bank and they use it for uh, packaging things up to go out. Any questions before the next topic? Okay. This is the announcement I wanted to talk about. Today at lunch, there's going to be a meeting of those interested in the future of BSD CAM. We want people interested in ensuring there is an ongoing succession plan. If you're interested in doing some work in that area, you should be at that meeting. It's going to be in this room. So after your last talk this morning, go grab your lunch, come back here. Now, Michael. Michael is going to say a few words. Do you need slides? No, I don't need slides. Okay, just you just need, need a spot. Okay, here. You got room? Yep. Take that. Take that. Okay. Um, Dan asked me 10 years ago to, uh, Excuse me. There you go. Go for it. to uh, help pick papers for BSD CAN, and I didn't realize this was a lifetime appointment. <laughs> but okay. Um, we, we've had a good committee, but time has kind of moved on. Uh, David and I are, are still pretty hardcore, but you know, Greg Leahy, he has, he, he's retired and he, he's yeah, still pitches in, but he's really focusing on important things like beer. Um, you know, Todd Miller is Mr. Pseudo. We, we have Robert on demand. Drew helps with registration. All of that is great. And Dan here, we all see that he's a great coordinator. This is in self-defense. Uh, you, you may remember everybody in this room going to lunch at the sports bar, uh, across from site, where they had one waitress. Zampub, yes. Uh, we've had power, network, all this stuff in the early years that were trouble. And Dan has this down to a science. Um, and I don't think people really realize just how much work he's had to do. And we're, we're, the work is kind of striped across all of these people. And, you know, RAID Zero is fine, but we really need an actual redundant array of independent Dans. <laughs> uh, and, and it's not just Dan. I mean, those of us on the committee, uh, yes, we sat down and reviewed papers, but I had my appendix out this year, and I distinctly remember sitting there with very, very nice drugs pouring through my system, looking at these paper proposals and going, yes, rockets, we need more rockets. <laughs> um, you know, Dan here, he gives up t two weeks a year just for BSD can. Yes, PGCon kind of piggybacks on the end and some of that, but without them, it would still be a good two weeks for this man. Um, it, on the committee, we could use a little more help. I mean, we do our best, but we need someone who can honestly and truthfully call BS on Henning. You know, we're, we're just not equipped to really do that at a technical level. Um, Dan organizes all of the travel. Uh, there are probably some of you have companies that have a travel agent, that, even in-house, that could just sprinkle some corporate dust on this and that work would go away from him. Uh, he shepherds the speakers, which people are great about saying, I want to talk. They're not so great about saying uh, when they'd like to fly in and that they actually will appear and someone just has to sit on the speakers until they answer the email. Um, Website maintenance, Dan does all of that. Uh, someone should know how to do the crap this man does, and it, it should be across many different people. He's made it as easy as it can be done, uh, and he, he's far too self-effacing to come up here and say that he busts his ass. That you can tell because it's got this great big crack in it. So. 
And, you know, we all know he will give the shirt off of his back. So please show up at noon. Uh, think about what you can do, what your organization can do to do some of this and make sure that BSD can is around another 10 years. After that, I figure it's someone else's problem. Thank you, Michael. Um, some of you may be, uh, can you at the back read what my t-shirt says? Oh. It says, patch your shit. Anyone heard of that phrase before? Anyone know what podcast it comes from? It comes from something called TechSnap. Alan, can you stand up, please? Alan's one of the two presenters on a, a weekly podcast called TechSnap. OK, you can sit down now. Um, <laughs> and I've listened to all 100 or so, 100 and, 110 broadcasts. And it's pretty interesting. They always, almost always, over the past few months, have something mentioned about BSD. It's a good, interesting um, podcast. I recommend it, not just because Alan gave me the T-shirt. Uh, yeah, if you all watch all every single episode, you get a T-shirt. Oh no, I got the, uh, sorry. Yeah, it's a limited edition, so you can't get any more T-shirts. Any questions before I send you on to the talks? Because it's now ten o'clock. Nothing more? OK. Uh, if the next, the next talks will be running slightly late, but you've got half an hour between that talk and the next talk. So on you go.